Welcome to the Saturday edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. Today is November 2nd, 2013. I'm Holly Seiler, leading the news tonight. ConocoPhillips recently announced profits for Alaska operations that totaled $494 million for the third quarter of 2013. Senator Bill Willinkowski and Anchorage Democrats said while Alaskans ponder the upcoming referendum vote on the so-called oil wealth giveaway, the report shows that Alaska continues to be a harvesting profit center for the oil industry. Willinkowski said ConocoPhillips made nearly $23,000 an hour in profit in Alaska. He said that outpaced their profits in the lower 48, Canada and Latin America combined. The profits in Alaska come out to five, over $5 million per day, come out to over $22,000 per hour every single hour for the third quarter of this past year. We always hear, well, Alaska is not as profitable as other places around the world. You can look and you can compare the profits per barrel. They made $6.64 profit per barrel in, in the lower 48 in Latin America. They made $32 profit per barrel in Alaska. 27-year-old Nathan Jackson and his sister, 20-year-old Haley Jelinek of Fairbanks, have been sentenced on federal drug charges. Jackson was ordered to serve 123 months and three years of supervised release. He had pleaded guilty to drug conspiracy and money laundering. Jelinek was sentenced to six months in prison and three years of supervised release for money laundering conspiracy. The U.S. Attorney's Office said officers seized over seized over $350,000 in cash from Jackson and his co-conspirators, as well as two vehicles, two watercrafts, and a trailer. The investigation was conducted by the Internal Revenue Service, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Alaska State Troopers, and the North Pole Police Department. Crews at Denali National Park have cleared a landslide from a road that is a major tourist destination each summer. The landslide discovered last week covered 200 feet of the Denali Park Road with rock and soil. Crews finished cleaning that road um, Monday night. Park officials say it's not clear if instability of the terrain will affect visitors next summer. Park spokeswoman Maureen Galtieri says the roads 37 miles from the park entrance appear to be intact. An estimated 30,000 yards of debris fell from 500 feet above the road. Galtieri says the debris were pushed down slope off the road. The road and slide area will be assessed next spring before it reopens to traffic. National Park Service's authority to enforce federal regulations on state-owned lands in national parks in Alaska, according to a federal judge. U.S. District Judge H. Russell Holland rejected a lawsuit from an Anchorage man who sued after being ordered to leave Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve for using a hovercraft to hunt moose on the Nation River. The state of Alaska also had joined John Sturgeon's lawsuit in hopes of winning a ruling that may have limited the federal government's authority on state-owned waters in national parks. Holland found that regulations prohibiting hovercrafts in the Yukon Charlie Rivers Preserve and helicopters in the Katmai Preserve weren't adopted solely for those areas, but for the entire national park system. Sturgeon is expected to appeal. As we reported earlier this week, a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender equality event is scheduled for Monday in support for House Bill 139. The event will take place inside the Wood Center Ballroom at 9 p.m. House Bill 139 would make discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression illegal in our state in the areas of employment, credit and financing, public accommodations, as well as sale and rental of property. This bill would add to the current powers of the Human Rights Commission, which prohibits discrimination based on race sex, religion, or national origin. Guest speakers will include Chancellor Brian Rogers, Representative Beth Curtella, student, student Regent Courtney Enright, and Alaska ACLU, ACLU Executive Director Josh Decker. Coordinators of the rally explain the importance of the event. The timing is so important is that there's so much happening nationwide uh, for the LGBT community. Um, the recent passage of uh, the, the Supreme Court decisions on DOMA and California Proposition 8 have focused the nation on the, the issues involved in equality, as well as Senator Murkowski's recent support of gay marriage. So, so this particular panel is about HB 139, but it, the time is now to, make, to have these talks, you know, and to make these kinds of decisions. 
When we come back, Halloween is officially over and the first sign of the holidays sets up at Pioneer Park. And the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District releases their mobile app. We'll have those stories and much more when the weekend's only local televised newscast returns. Stay with us. Welcome back. A group tasked with recommending ways to increase the consumption and purchase of wild seafood and local farm products is holding its first meeting. The Alaska Food Resource Working Group is scheduled to meet Monday in Anchorage. The group was created by an administrative order. Its members include representatives of eight state agencies. Its objective is to work with the public and interested parties to promote a healthy food system in Alaska. With our first sticking snow, the Fairbanks area is taking on an appearance of a winter wonderland. This also means that the holiday season is just about upon us. What better way to prepare for the season of giving gifts than to attend the University Women's Association Holiday Bazaar today at the Civic Center in Pioneer Park. All three floors were packed with more than 100 vendors selling items that, for the most part, were crafted here in Alaska. The receipts recipients from the two-day event will go a long way with with helping students at UAF. Our goal in putting this bazaar on is to earn money for scholarships for UAF students. So everything we make here, those proceeds go to the Friends of UWA Scholarship Fund. So we've got over, I would say, just around 100 vendors on these two days. Uh, a full 25 of them will be new vendors tomorrow. So we have a reason to have folks come down both days. We've got lots and lots of people out here, so everybody's really enjoying the variety of goods. The bazaar will continue on Sunday from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. With support from Pogo Mind, the school district released an app last week which is designed for both parents and students. New Center 11's Tyson Paris Hansen has more. It really is one of the first mobile apps of its kind in Fairbanks. And we heard from parents, uh, the younger generation of parents, that they wanted mobile access, so fingertip access to student grades, attendance, lunch balance, and things like that. So um, I got to work and we identified a vendor on Lower 48 that created an app that allows parents to access grades, attendance, lunch balance, and it's just as convenient for students. They've been getting good reviews online as more people download the app. Students and parents seem to like being able to see grades updated throughout the semester. The district started out with 130 people testing the final product, but after releasing it to the public, there are now about 900 users so far. Really, it's, it's a small portion of the, the, the demographic we're trying to reach. We'd like to increase that to as many as 7,000 users who have a mobile, uh, mobile access to student grades and things like that. The app also connects to a school calendar to show upcoming events. It has a teacher and staff directory and school news updates. The school district gave a huge thank you to Pogo Mine, who worked as a business partner to fund the app, which costed about $25,000 to create. The goal was to help connect parents with their student, but the app is also useful for students too. The best way to find this app is to go into either Google Play, which is where you go for Android devices, or into the App Store and search Fairbanks School District, and it'll come up. Tyson Paris Hansen, New Center 11. West Madden Real Estate and KTVF are teaming up yet again for another great cause. This time the annual toy drive will also partner with the local Walmart. The purpose is to gather toys for the less fortunate children in our community to ensure that they will be able to experience the holidays as well. Those who want to donate toys can drop them off at bins inside of Walmart. Members of the organizations that are spearheading the drive say they look forward each year to giving back to the community that gives so much to them. The coat drive's winding down, but very soon we're going to be starting for the holiday season our toy drive where we partner up with KTVF and Walmart, and you'll see a big box at the front door of Walmart where you can just buy a toy and put it in the box. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, it's part of our core values is to give back to our team and our community. Uh, so that's what, we, that's what we strive for. So, Fred, what's going on this weekend in sports? What's going on this weekend in sports? There's a lot of hockey this weekend. It snowed outside. Yeah. So now it's we're now we're allowed to play hockey. All right. So we're gonna talk about that. Let's got some football. Come back. Sports next. Welcome back, Interior Alaska. Fred Brown holding down sports duties on this Saturday. We held off in snow as long as we could, but now it's here, and so it's only appropriate that we start this cast off on the frozen pond. The Fairbanks Ice Dogs are on the road and visiting the home of their former division rival, the Wenatchee Wild. 
The reunion of enemies wasn't how Fairbanks wanted things to go, as the Wild jumped out to an early two-goal lead in the first period. The Dogs would put on the pressure, firing 38 goals on net when all was said and done, but it wouldn't be enough. The Wild extended their lead late in the second, and the Dogs came out in the third with a furious run, but it wasn't to be, as they fall 3-2 final. It's staying on the ice, but moving to the college level as the Alaskan Annex played host to Northern Michigan last night at the Carlson Center. My weekday doppelganger Joe Cook was in attendance for the Nooks' first conference game in the Western Collegiate Hockey Association. Both teams looking for wins in their WCHA debuts, and the Nanix will make their case first with the Morley brothers making it happen for the Nooks. Tyler Morley scored on a power play with a blue liner, beating Michael Doan for the first score of the game at 1244. A couple of minutes later, little brother Brandon scores his first career goal after the assist from Fairbanks' own Alec Hadukovic, his first point of the season, 2-0 Nanux. The teams would go two for two. Stefan VJ put the Wildcats on the board with two minutes and seven seconds remaining in the first period. Then less than five minutes into the second stanza, number 22 Adair scored the equalizer to make it a 2-2 game. Then later in that second period, Garrett Perry takes a bad spill into the boards. He would be okay. Northern called for a five-minute major boarding call. And then 30 seconds later, a tripping call so the Nanix can cash in on a five-on-three advantage. And they would with a Marcus Passar goal, 10-35 in the second period, 3-2 Nanix. Northern was called for another penalty right after Bassar's score. The Nooks still have a five-on-three advantage, 45 seconds elapsed and Colton Beck scores back-to-back -back power play goals for UAF, making it a 4-2 game. Lots of firsts for UAF in this one because with three minutes remaining in the second period, Nolan Heisman finds Sean Hochhausen for his first career goal. Nanix lead 5-2, scoring three unanswered to close out that second period. But the Wildcats claw their way back late in this one. C.J. Ludwig, the team captain, he scored with less than five minutes remaining on a power play to make it a 5-3 game, so it's not over yet. Then Adair, he strikes again, his second goal of the game with two minutes left, 5-4 Nanix. But UAF, with their stout defense, would bring this one home, getting a 5-4 victory in their WCHA debut. Those power play goals were huge last night. And while the season is still very young, it's a huge area of improvement. One of the glaring points of weakness on the past year's Iceman squad was UAF's inability to capitalize on the man advantage. In 180 power plays last season, the Nooks only found Twine on 26 of those attempts for a 14.4% success rate. For the 2011-2012 season, things were only slightly better, converting on 26 of 164 attempts for a 16% success rate. However, so far this season, the Nooks have vastly improved, depositing eight goals on 32 power plays, succeeding 25% of the time. Execution, and I thought both units uh, did a real good job. I mean, one was a rebound goal, and the other one, you know, we talk a lot on the power plays that, you know, they can, you need to create some positive momentum from them, and usually it's by outworking the other team, and generally chances will come off of that. And if you look at Colton's goal, I mean, it was a great shot, first of all, but I mean, uh, uh, Ray and, and Heise did a heck of a job winning that battle and scooting it up to Michael Quinn. And, and we talk all the time is that established control of the puck is the first, first thing we need to do. So the guys worked hard on those loose pucks and, and you know, then they make a skilled play and score. So, I mean, especially teams are really important. I mean, um, for the most part, I thought, our, like I said, I thought our discipline was good. Oh now, a little pigskin tomorrow night right here on KTVF features one team that's on top of its game and another trying to find some rhythm. Welcome to the set, Football Night America. Dan Patrick, Tony Dungy, Rodney Harrison, two teams coming off a bye week. Texans certainly could use it. Colts got a bye week as well. Um, thoughts going into this matchup? More on the Texans trying to salvage a season or the Colts? Uh, it's both, and, and both teams have question marks. For the Texans, who's going to be your quarterback? Case Keenum gave him a lift, but Matt Schaub got healthier. For the Colts, who replaces Reggie Wayne? You, you lost not only a great player, but a leader. And so that, that becomes a big question over the bye. And that's the big question for me because you look at Reggie Wayne, you talk about his leadership and his impact. And my big question is, when it comes down 
to a critical moment, maybe a third down and five, who's that guy that's going to go across the middle? Who's going to make that tough catch in the red zone? And that's the big question for me. Well, it's one thing to replace <clears throat> running backs, you know, Vic Ballard. They, they've had injuries there, but Reggie is one of those fixtures. It's kind of hard, and, he, you know, you coached him. His role as a leader is now is it more on Andrew Luck? Uh, it, it will be more on Andrew, and Reggie was one of those guys who, yeah, he's going to give you 100 catches, but he's also going to go out there and practice on, on Mondays after tough games and show those young receivers how to do things, and they're going to miss that. But you say it's more on Andrew Luck, but shouldn't it be more on Trent Richardson? They traded mm. for him, they brought him over there, and he's flat point blank. He's been a disappointment. He has not been a Trent Richardson that we expected him to be. What about the Texans? What are you playing for? You know, Pride? You, no, no, you can steal <laughs> that second wild card in the AFC. All it's going to take, Dan, it might only take eight wins. So, you know, you, you're sitting there over your bye and saying, you know what, we get this thing together. We're playing good defense. If we can just play offense close to what we're capable of, we can get back on this thing with a couple of wins in a row. Colts at the Texans Sunday night on NBC. We will see you on Football Night in America at 7 Eastern. And that will be a wrap on my time tonight. I might be out, but we're not done, so don't go anywhere because I have to yell at Holly for causing the roads to be so terrible. That rant and weather is coming up next. So you were yelling at me before we came back, and everybody always blames me for the bad weather, but no one ever thanks me for the good weather. Thank you for the good weather. It was nice. It was lovely. I enjoyed October. It was great. But I don't enjoy going down my hill this morning sideways in my truck shouting your name because it is your fault and you need to correct it. Fred needs to slow down and so does everyone else. We're going to get right into the Almanac. Here's the Almanac for the first Saturday in November. It shows a normal high of 18 degrees and a normal low of 2 degrees. The record high was set in 1926 at 48 degrees and the record low, proving that things could always be worse, was set in 1907 at 33 below. The sun rose this morning at 9.44 a.m. and will set around 5.26 p.m going to give us seven hours and 42 minutes of daylight, a seven-minute loss since yesterday. Here is weather around our great state today. Fort Yukon is partly cloudy, while Barrow is clear with some flurries. It's partly cloudy in Nome, partly cloudy in Fairbanks, and partly cloudy in Healy. Ketchikan is mostly cloudy, while Bethel is seeing some overcast skies, a chance of rain for Cold Bay, mostly cloudy skies for Kodiak and Homer. Valdez is expecting snow showers today, and Anchorage will be overcast, a high in the mid-40s. On to our friends in the lower 48. Seattle is mostly cloudy today with highs in the high 50s. Las Vegas is clear today with highs in the low 70s. It's mostly cloudy in Billings with a chance of rain, highs in the mid 50s. Dallas is clear with highs in the high 60s. It's partly cloudy in Minneapolis with highs in the low 50s. It's also partly cloudy in St. Louis with highs in the mid 50s. Miami is mostly cloudy with highs in the high 80s and it's a clear day in New York, highs in the high 60s. Back in Alaska, tomorrow's forecast for up north will is expected to be overcast in Fort Yukon, while Barrow and Nome will see mostly cloudy skies. It's overcast in both Fairbanks and Healy tomorrow, with highs in the 20s for Fairbanks and 30s for Healy. Clear skies are projected for Juneau, while Ketchikan will see partly cloudy skies. And there's a chance of rain in both Bethel and Cold Bay tomorrow. Kodiak will see mostly cloudy skies. And South Central is calling for overcast skies tomorrow. Homer will see a chance of rain, while Valdez will get some snow. And our snow seems to be sticking. Could this really be at Fairbanks? Highs tonight around 20 degrees, partly cloudy skies with some light wind projected. And a high of 30 degrees is expected tomorrow with overnight lows for Sunday night sitting around 25 degrees. And it looks like we will see much more of that kind of weather in the upcoming week. Some light snow on Tuesday and the fog will be rolling in come Friday. We'll see high 20s and low in the teens. High 20 days and lows in the teens until next weekend. And please don't forget tonight is fall back. We will resume standard time at 2 a.m. tomorrow morning, giving you a whole extra hour to do with what you will. Fred, whatever will you do with your extra hour? I will spend that hour contemplating whatever happened to that hour we lose. I mean, I, have you ever just thought about it? That hour's gone. <laughs> no. Well, but I think hope about that it. you guys do something more productive with think that Think about hour. the hour you've just lost and wonder what happened to it. That will wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. We're really glad you could join us. Join us here six days a week at 6 and 11 or online anytime at webcenter11.com. From all of us here at the News Center, have a great night.